Hey everybody, welcome. We're live, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh my gosh. Hey, guess what, everybody? I'm flying solo today. It's me by myself bringing you all of the information. So we're live here on Keto Chat Live, this podcast that's interactive, fun, educational. Uh, so, you know, this, what are we going to talk about today? What am I going to talk about? And, um, have you had some success on keto, but started to regain your weight? Today is part three of our three-part series about how to make keto weight loss sustainable. Um, so you're in the right place if you've uh, had struggles with keto. Like pattern I'm noticing with my clients is that last year has been really challenging to help people stay on track. So if you're somebody who's fallen off of keto, uh, are you a higher weight than you started uh, do you worry that you'll never be able to lose weight and keep it off? Have you been fearing that keto failed you as well as all the other diets you've tried? So you're in the right place. This show is for you. Um, this is an interactive show, so I'm glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm your host, Carol Freeman. Uh, I have a master's in nutrition and clinical health psychology. I'm a certified clinical hypnotherapist. I'm also a board certified keto nutrition specialist. So uh, I love mashing all those things together, helping people uh, address their uh, psychology of why they're eating the way that they are so that they can sustain those things. So, um, and uh, let me just issue this medical disclaimer here. So this show is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not medical ad advice nor intended to diagnose, treat, cure any condition. If you have any medical condition, illness, disease, or are taking any medications, please, please uh, reach out to your medical professional, your healthcare provider. All right. So uh, quiz for our viewers, true or false? Once you lose weight on keto and heal your metabolism, then you could just slowly go back to eating the foods that you were before and having a much higher carb intake. So give me a T or an F in the comments uh, as you're watching. Even if you're watching the replay, um, let me know what you think the answer is to that. So uh, guess what? We're still trending, still trending in Poland and Greece, everyone. So we're in the top 100 nutrition podcasts in both of those country uh, countries. So uh, if you're listening from there, um, you know, send me a message. Um, let me know you're one of our fans, one of the ones that are taking us to the top of the charts there. So, um, hey, so um, I mentioned this in the last episode, but I'm going to keep benching it. And I have a brand new, uh, yay, Susan's here. I was worried that uh, nobody, Facebook was going to ban me after last time and not tell anybody about the podcast. So I'm so glad you're here, Susan. Um, let's see. So text number, I've got a brand new text number to share with everybody. Yes, I'm doing this live on air. 602-704-5309. Uh, uh, join my text community. Um, that's a direct line directly to me. So, um, we'll send special notices out. Um, and, uh, that way, if you want to know when we're going live here, then I can send you a text reminder too. So, um, welcome, welcome. Yeah, this is my first episode flying solo, so I can do this everyone. So thank you for being here. Interactive show for those of you that are here, just, you know, type in a little comment, let me know where you're joining from. So I know you're here. Uh, so I know I'm not alone in the world. Um, a little personal check-in. I'm, I'm getting ready right after we're done here. I get to go to a, a podcasting conference. So I live in the Phoenix, Arizona area, and this podcast is in one of our suburbs. And I'm really excited because I used to go to conferences a lot in the pre, you know, you know, a year or two ago when things were different in the world, um, I would go to a lot of podcasts, uh, sorry, a lot of conferences. And I love that. I am an extrovert and I need to be around people. And I just love that. So a lot of low carb uh, keto conferences I would go to. And uh, usually like once a month, I was going someplace uh, cool and warm and sunny, which is part of what made me want to move to Phoenix was this I was from Seattle and I was tired of the constant rain and gray skies. And so uh, not being able to go to conferences the last year and a half, I decided, well, I might as well move someplace. It makes me feel like I'm at a conference all the time. So this is um, the first conference I'll be going to in the last uh, year, about a year and a half. And it's right in my backyard over here. So I'm pretty excited. It's three days. Um, it's called She Podcasts. Po podcasts. That's an easy word to say, right? She podcasts live. 
And um, it's all for women and non-binary uh, people to um, network. And there's lots and lots of uh, sessions. It looks like a massive conference. Um, I don't know how many will be in attendance, but I've already picked out my uh, agenda and there were lots of good topics to choose from. So I'm really excited about that to learn how to better uh, deliver this to all of you to reach um, reach more people, send the message out, um, just get better connected um, with you listeners and viewers out there. So, so glad you're here. Um, and excited for this podcast. I'm sure it's going to be overwhelming. After three days, I'll probably want to take uh, a nap for two days, take a couple days off. So, um, but really looking forward to that. So tonight's their kickoff. They have a um, garden party. Oh my gosh, you guys, I got to tell you about the, uh, let's see if I can look it up. So they had, um, they sent out like when I registered, so I got a VIP ticket because I just wanted to connect with people at, that also have a VIP ticket. Um, they're going to be people that may be good potential clients, but also just people that'll be a good connection for me. So I look forward to connecting with people that can be potential uh, future guests here. Um, so things that are a good um, adjunctive to following keto for long term. Um, so they sent out, no, part of the registration process for the conference was they asked, uh, you know, what are your dietary preferences? And I was really excited because I thought, oh my gosh, that'll be so great because they'll have snacks there that are not going to be just pure carbs like most conferences. And um, so they sent out a notice um, this morning saying, uh, VIP ticket holders, please join us for breakfast uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And then they listed off all the things that they were going to be offering for us. Coffee, tea, fruit, berries, pastries, and breakfast breads. Right? I'm like, oh, no, can't get a little bit of protein for breakfast there? Like, mm. Um, and it just reminds me the difference of every time going to a low carb or keto conference, everyone there is eating low carb. And so they have plenty of energy in the afternoon. How many of you listening have ever been to a conference, um, where they give you lunch or they have snacks and stuff like that, or by the coffee table, they've got, you know, pastries and things like that. And how many people in the afternoon are just like nodding off? They're, they're, they're just not awake. Um, cause they've just filled their belly with carbs at lunchtime or they just keep snacking on them all day long. And it's people just start fading in the afternoon, but going to the keto conferences, the low carb conferences, um, there, you didn't have that people were awake and alert in the afternoon and they could pay attention just as easily in the afternoon as they could earlier in the day. So, uh, this is going to be a very different, um, it's been a while since I've been to a conference that was non keto. And so it'll be really, really interesting to see everyone, uh, nodding off and falling asleep in the conference, uh, it, especially after starting, um, you know, breakfast tomorrow with that. So I'm going to go, I'm going to have coffee. I'm going to throw some hard boiled eggs or maybe some, uh, Jack links beef sticks in my bag and, uh, you know, just network with everybody, but also just silently observe how sleepy and tired everyone is and, uh, gassy and bloated perhaps. So, um, also I just thought it was really funny, right? That I I've never heard the term breakfast breads, um, but I realized that's code for cake uh, that we just rebrand and make it seem like something that's legal to eat for breakfast, right? Like if you said like, we're going to have cake for a breakfast uh, networking meeting, nope, everybody would be like, what are you doing? But if you call it breakfast bread, oh yeah, no, that seems, that's normal. We would want that at breakfast. Um, so yeah, listeners can appreciate how much different you feel after a uh, low carb um adequate protein breakfast, how much more alert and, uh, going to a conference would be so challenging, right? Um, Susan, have you ever been to, uh, have you ever been to a conference? It's, it's, a it's, a I, I as an extrovert again, I love it meeting people. And, um, I hope to learn so much to be able to do uh, way better podcast for you all here. So, um, so next segment here, I just want to share, um, you know, client success story here, just so check in with some of my um, clients. And the reason I do this, I say this every week, but um, the reason I do this is, um, um, so those of you watching, give me a comment, let me know where you're joining us from. Uh, love to know if you're here. And uh, so anyway, so um, client success stories, I found you know, early in my journey, they were something that really, really um, motivated me, made me feel like I'm not alone and that keto can work. And so I just want to share 
uh, each each episode, um, you know, some success stories. And so this is going to be a story about Rita, Trina, and Jen. And so for my clients, we do um, I offer them twice a week um, small group video conference calls, uh, coaching, troubleshooting, um, motivation, all that kind of stuff. So this was a call last week that Rita, Trina, and Jen were on, and um, I just love this energy. So I want to share this story. So Rita and uh, Trina are people that have been with me for about a year. And uh, one has lost about 65 pounds and the other's lost 70 pounds. And they've had tremendous success. Um, and both are doing, um, you know, different things contribute to their success, right? So Rita is somebody that every single week she's coming on one of those calls. Um, and she's, uh, also one of my peer mentors. And so she gets an extra bonus call with me with that. And, um, Rita is a CrossFitter and she, um, works out really hard and that's part of her success as well. Whereas, um, Trina's success, um, she's periodically been checking in with me. Um, but she's also done a ton of, uh, personal care things, reorganizing, <clears throat> excuse me, where'd that come from? Uh, reorganizing her life in the last year to really prioritize taking care of herself. And that's made a huge difference. And oh my gosh, I hadn't seen her in a few months when she came on last week and the transformation was just amazing. She looks so amazing. And, um, Okay, Susan's sharing that she's been to a lot of conferences with uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. I'll tell you, like, I was a big, before keto, like, I, I was a big donut fan, but I've never, ever understood Krispy Kreme. Like, never think anything that really appealed to me. I know everybody loves them. I know people will wait in line for hours at the store to get them. But to me, it's just like this undercooked dough ball. And I don't know. Like, I'm glad I never <laughs> had a thing for those. But I'll tell you, plenty of other donuts got my attention. So, um yeah. The, oh boy. Yeah. I'll, I'll, um, I don't like to trigger anybody. So I don't know that I'll take, I'll probably take photos of, of the, uh, Carbapalooza that's available at this conference and then share it with my closest friends, but not try to uh, trigger anyone else with it. So, uh, yeah. So, so Trina and, uh, Rita have both been about a year, very successful, 65 to 70 pounds lost each, uh, really prioritizing self-care. And then, um, Jen was on there, um, she's really been struggling. And I, I shared this a little bit earlier in this episode, but um, that's what a trend that I've noticed, unfortunately, in my clients this year compared to all the other years. I've been doing this work for six years now, and there just seems to be a higher percentage of them that are really struggling right now. And, um, and just brainstorming with my coaches. And um, I think it's just, uh, it's, it's a time of like mental fatigue of stress, unprecedented levels, hopelessness, and uh, just really wears on us. And most people, you know, they've just used food as a comfort thing for so long that when we're in a stressful time, too long of a stressful time, it just wears down our best intentions. And so, um, you know, it doesn't mean that it's hopeless and we should all give up, but it's just something to be aware of that I'm seeing more and more people are really struggling with eating um, healthfully. And so the synergy between these ladies was so beautiful, right? Because um, to Jen, she probably thought that, oh, Rita and Trina, it's so easy for them. They just stayed with it for the last year and they've lost so much weight. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do the same thing? Um, but Rita and Trina, uh, and this is weird their names rhyme, but like that's, I'm actually using their real name. So um they shared that with, they were so supportive of Jen. Uh, they said that they'd been in her shoes so many times as well. Uh, countless times that they had started on some healthy eating uh, journey and fallen off and gained the weight back and more. And so the support that was there was just absolutely beautiful. And so I'm, I'm sharing all this to know that um, there will be a time that it, it clicks for you. And if you get the right support and engage fully in all of the different um, factors of that, it will make a big difference. And that's, you know, today's episode is about the part three of how to make uh, keto weight loss sustainable so that you're not falling back on track. And it does take, there's a lot of different um, things it takes to get in place. And for each person, it's a little bit different of the different things that they need in order to be successful long term. So, you know, the moral of the story is that don't give up. Um, that getting the right support and utilizing all the different aspects of that is the key, but also knowing that for some people, it's not a straight line that the first time you try, it may not be the time that sticks and don't give up on yourself. Um, it doesn't mean that you're starting over from zero. You've learned something from, um, you know, that experience. And then the things I'm going to share today also, um, you know, 
work that into your uh, your approach so that um, you know you have the best chance of being successful. But short story, don't give up. It's gonna work. Um, you can do it. Um, you know, the truth is is the finding the one way that you can stick with to eat for indefinitely is the answer, okay? And you know, that doesn't really matter what the eating style is, but if it's something that works for you and you enjoy the way that you feel when you eat that way, uh, you like the taste of the foods, um, so on and so forth, that can be an option. And for keto, that's a lot of, for a lot of people, that is a much more enjoyable way of eating than they ever had before. Um, they enjoy not having the cravings, um, having a low appetite, and it just makes it, and, and the food tastes delicious when you have that higher fat uh, food, it gives a different level of satiety too. So, um, so that's, that's who I'm working with is those people that know that keto is the way that they want to eat. Um, I'm just providing structure, fine tuning, uh, the psychology side of, of things to make things really, uh, stick long-term. So, um, yay for Rita and Trina and Jen, um, doing great work. Um, so I, uh, news article, uh, news segment, I wish I had some music for that that like let you know that's the new segment. Um, maybe if I get fancy someday, I'll have that for you. But uh, so really cool. So um, I love getting e emails from Chris Cresser. He's one of the early um, health mentors that I've followed like, oh gosh, probably, probably 15 years now I've been following his work. Just a super smart guy. And so this came in an email from him. Um, fascinating. So fascinating. So this is a study that looked at... Um, uh, you know, smoking in mice, which, you know, one, one hand, maybe that's a cute little image of like a cartoon mouse smoking or something like that. Oh wait, I did the wrong kind of smoking. Um, and, um, but I, uh, I don't know the details of how they did that, but what they found, okay. So, um, they found that when the father smokes cigarettes, the harmful effects get passed down to his kids and grandkids. Doesn't that seem crazy? How, how, how? So there are genetic changes that happen that even the father side, right? Like, so we often blame a lot of things on the mom and, you know, like we all know that smoking while you're pregnant is bad because it's going to affect the baby, right? But it turns out even if the father smokes, not only is that going to affect his offspring, but his offspring's offspring. Um, so, okay, I'm going to put this. Oh, this is a really long, let's see, article because it's got all the, the link. Okay, I'm going to trim this down a little bit because this has got all the stuff that comes from it being originally an email that was sent. So let's see if this still works. Okay, here. I'm going to give you a different link. I was going to send the one that's the really long one. That's crazy. We don't need that really big um, one. Just do a little bit. So this was published in Pl PLOS Biology, P-L-O-S. I don't know if you're supposed to say that or just P-L-O-S. Uh, P-L-O-S, you can follow along. I just put that in the uh, um, comments there on YouTube and Facebook. And for those of you listening, this will be in the show notes as well that you can see a link to this article. So nicotine exposure of male mice produces behavioral impairment in multiple generations of descendants, okay? So uh, so this is, this is to share that like, I mean, if you already have kids, it might be too late for you now, but know that what your children eat now uh, is going to affect not only their kids, but their grandkids as well. So, you know, this is just a study on nicotine, but the same is true of our eating habits as well. And so, uh, in, you know, hopefully this helps your whole family eat healthfully because it's just going to affect everybody down the line. Uh, if eating poorly having poor eating habits, not eating in a way that's healthful for you. Uh, if you knew that was going to affect your grandkids, would that change how you're eating a little bit? Um, would it change if you knew that how you fed your children was going to affect their grandkids? Uh, would you maybe reconsider what things you're feeding them? So um, really fascinating research. And um, so, oh, and the more, the what also is with this, is that um, this affects dopamine in the brain. So basically it affects how much cravings that your kids are going to have. So um, so this is, an, this is affecting the dopaminergic part of the brain, which is what causes cravings. And so if you have parents that were uh, smokers or, um, 
you know, food addicts or drug users um, that, or grandparents, did I say grandparents, parents and grandparents, this could be part of why it's so challenging for you to stick with a uh, specific eating style where you're cutting out highly rewarding foods um, because you're genetically predisposed because of what your grandparents did and your parents to crave more in general. Uh, um, just unbelievably uh, interesting and cool, right? So uh, part of it might be like, okay, it's not your fault. Um, your grandparents used all these things, were overweight or smoked or things like that. But also um, it doesn't mean that you should just give up. Um, just know that part of the struggle, the cravings that you're experiencing uh, are because of your genetic predisposition for that. So uh, pretty cool stuff, right? Um, all right. So, um, all right. Up next, here's our, here's our, here's our topic du jour is part three of a three part series I've done. So if you miss the other two after you're done, well, actually you may want to go back and listen to part one and two. Um, so this is, we're at episode 24 here. So in episode 22 and 23, I did part one and part two of the series. And so make sure you get all of those. Um, they are, you can understand that each of them individually. So go ahead and finish listening to this one. Uh, and then go back and listen to the other ones as well. So you get the full picture. So, um, you know, just a little background on this is that, um, you know, with my, the reason I have degrees in both nutrition and psychology is that they're inseparable. Like I'm so passionate about helping, uh, people, especially women, be able to make long-term uh, habit change in especially their eating habits and healthy lifestyle. And if you ignore the psychology side of this, it's it's so hard. It's so hard. Um, and so, um, you know, I've been doing this work with clients for over six years now. And I uh, last year, I put together a long-term membership to be able to help my clients stay on track um, and to be able to lose the weight and keep it off. And so I was doing research at that time. What is it that research shows that people need in order to maintain their dietary change, right? Because how many of you listening uh, have gone on a diet and it worked for a while and then for some reason you fell off of it and then you just gained all the weight back, right? Raise your hand. Uh, if you've been there, say yes in the comments here. Let me know. Um, but yes, every one of us, right? Pretty sure anyone who's here trying to follow keto has had that experience in the past. And so I wanted to find out like what is going to give people the best chance of being able to be successful and sticking with it. Because the truth is that no diet works unless you can stick with it indefinitely. And so uh, we always like to think of like, well, that diet worked because I lose, lost that weight, but we forget the part about the diet after the diet. What do we do after that? Um, so you need to find something that you act actually can stick with for the long term. So, um, and uh Donna's here. Donna, amen, sister, for sure. Yeah. Um, so in order to find a sustainable, like, so we need to find eating style, a lifestyle. Like would, a lot of people don't like to use the word diet because it connotes uh, like a short-term thing that you're doing. So you have to find a way of eating that you can live with the rest of your life. Uh, some people like to call it a lifestyle. Um, my coaching call with my clients this morning, one of them heard me say something about like following a therapeutic keto diet. She says, ah, oh, that resonates with me so much more. I like that phrase better than saying a keto lifestyle. Uh, I think she had some rebelliousness to like calling it a lifestyle sounds too trendy, right? So she liked thinking of it. She's doing something therapeutic, good self-care for herself. So, um, it, so Find that and then get the support and um, help that you need to stick with it. And so it requires a comprehensive approach. It has to be something that you can do for the long term. Um, and it requires support, um, education, and structure. Okay, it has to be structured. Um, all of us before we were trying to do keto or doing keto, um, we just ate anything we want, right? Like they fed us this lie for a long time saying that, oh, it's about balance and, you know, just eat a balanced diet and it's just about portion control and just don't eat too much and just exercise more, right? If that worked, nobody would have struggles with weight. And so, um, so we have to have some boundaries and that's kind of the topic I want to talk about today is setting up structure, setting up some boundaries for yourself so that you're eating foods that don't trigger overeating, that they don't trigger that part of the brain where you're just constantly craving. Okay. So, um, the truth is, is that we need some parameters. We need structure. We need rules about how we eat. 
in order to um, be able to lose weight long term, right? So one option is um, you eat low fat and you count calories indefinitely. Okay, so that's an option. Like that's kind of the model of how Weight Watchers is. Um, Noom is like that as well, where they give you a certain calorie amount and um, you you've got to stick with that. So that's one option. Um, some people like that. They like the flexibility to being able to eat whatever. But, uh, you know, a lot of the people I'm working with have tried that and they just feel hungry all the time and food obsessed. And so uh, my approach is about giving people uh, specific keto boundaries. And even within the keto world, there's all different approaches to this. But mine is about giving a certain specific structure to keto that makes it so that it's uh, it draws a line in the sand so that you're not consuming foods that make you obsessed with food, that make you overeat, that make you crave more. Okay. So, um, so I have started, I don't know if anybody else has read this book, but I just got this one today, Bright Line Eating. And somebody referred this book to me. So it's by, um, uh, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. And, um, I don't know when it was published. Let's look in the, the publishing page. This was, this was, this was, where is the date at? Okay. In 2017. Okay. So it's about four years old and somebody heard my approach to keto and they said, Oh, that sounds like bright line eating. And I was like, what's that? So uh, I got the book so I could keep up on that. And um, I like a lot of what she's saying. So she's actually got, um, I haven't got to her training yet. I just started the book today, but um, she really looks at the psychology of food addiction. And that's really one of the areas that I'm so passionate about and I've studied myself. So my approach, so while she doesn't promote keto, she has a very structured way of eating. So those of you that don't know the book, the bright line refers to like the, uh, the basically the rules that you set for yourself are the bright lines of how you eat. And you have to have that structure in order to uh, not trigger that rewarding part of the brain. And so, um, so we have to have rules. Unfortunately, we need to figure out the parameters, the rules and the structure of how we're going to eat. And then that has to be something that's agreeable that you can stick with for the rest of your life, right? So another example of, you know, structure to how you eat um, could be vegan. So some people like that. Um, I don't eat anything of animal origin. Okay. So there's a line, there's a bright line in the sand. Uh, it's structure. It's, it's, um, rules about how you eat. Okay. Um, for some people they like paleo. Um, so paleo has very specific guidelines about what foods they eat and what foods they don't eat. So, uh, typically it's no dairy, no grains, no refined sugar, no refined, um, uh, flour or grains. Um, you know, eating in a way that was more like, uh, ancestral eating, um, so for, for my clients, I teach them a way of doing keto that draws a line in the sand between uh, these highly processed foods that make us overeat, uh, addictive foods, highly palatable foods, reward foods, uh, and addictive foods. So let me tell you a little bit more about that, about how the brain works, right? So, um, you know, humans have been around for 200,000 years on this planet. And for the most of that time, uh, we just ate the foods that were available to us and we didn't have weight struggles. It was more likely that we would have challenges getting enough food than we would have getting too much food. And the foods that existed for all but maybe the last hundred years of us being on this planet. So uh, 100, wait, no, what's the math there? <laughs> 199,000 uh, uh 800, no wait, 900 <laughs> years. Wow, that's hard to do that math in my head. Uh, you know, so, uh, so I do that again. 190,000, 199,900 years of our existence. Um, we just ate the foods that were around. We didn't have to worry about having nutritious or calorie counting or exercising more or anything like that. We just ate the foods that were around and that was, that was all we needed to do to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, and, Lo and behold, the last hundred years, we've started being uh, doing things um, like figuring out how to process foods, how to refine them, how to concentrate sugars and carbohydrates, and how to refine sugar cane so they can add more sugar to everything, how to take wheat flour and grow it so it's got more starch in it and refine that to take out the fiber that's in there, and then we get this flour. Um, so all of that's happened uh, the last, you know, 100 years is, is when we've started to do all this food manufacturing and refining. Uh, 
200 years or a little bit more than that is when we started hybridizing food as well. So instead of whatever just grew wild, we started to crossbreed stuff and, and uh, um, you know, created farms and things like that that selectively bred different foods. Um, so grains and fruits specifically were ones that were hybridized so that they were higher in carbs and starches and sugars. But guess what? They weren't selectively breeding those to be higher in vitamins and minerals. And so uh, if you've ever looked online and found like there's an image of like what corn used to look like versus what corn looks like now. Uh, same thing with carrots, right? So carrots used to be these really thin little roots, wild carrots. Uh, now we have them their size of, uh, I don't know, a hot dog or bigger, right? Like big giant carrots. Same thing with strawberries, okay? So Anybody ever gone um, hiking where you found um, berries that grow in the wild? Like little wild strawberries are like the size of your pinky tip. Uh, really concentrated, very delicious, um, but they're tiny, tiny, tiny things. Um, we selectively bred strawberries now to be the size of like, I don't know, uh, a mouse or a, a gerbil or something, right? Like just giant size. Apples as well. That's another one that within my lifetime... Um, I remember growing up that my mom, you know, tried to pack us a healthy lunch and she always put a piece of fruit in there uh, that I've, I've confessed many times that I always threw it away because it never tasted good. You know, we had three kinds of apples you could choose from back then. Uh, and th this is not that long ago. So I'm 50. This is, uh, you know, 40 some years ago. Um, there was Granny Smith, Golden Delicious and Red Delicious. And none of them were delicious. I don't know who gave them that name. Somebody got paid too much marketing money to call them delicious apples because they weren't. Um, I threw them in the garbage every day. Uh, I, I finally confessed to my mom. I felt bad because I she packed it for us. She wanted us to eat it. Um, if I brought it home, uh, then, then she'd know I didn't eat it or I didn't want her to feel bad that she'd wasted her time by sending that with us. Um, years later, when I confessed to her, she says, oh, I didn't, I thought you liked it. You didn't come home with it every day. So I figured you liked it. So that's why I kept putting it in. She says, if I knew you didn't eat it, I would have never put it in there for you. So, uh, <laughs> the multiple levels of guilt there. Cause then I just wasted our family's money, uh, throwing away perfectly good food. So, um, but anyway, so, you know, that wasn't that long ago that there were three kinds of apples. That's all you had to choose from. And again, they weren't very good. Who remembers red delicious apples and how mealy they were and just not, you know, not tasty really. And so fast forward to now modern day and the types of apples we've gotten, how big they are, the size of small child's head, extremely sweet. They taste delicious, right? Because they've been selectively bred over the last 40 years to be really, really high in sugar. Um, no, not one advertisement for apples tells you like, oh, a good source of this vitamin or mineral and this, you know, the, 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 um, what are some of the brands right now? The, the Cameo Apple has 10 times more vitamin C than traditional apples. Nope, you've never heard that, right? Uh, but people love fruit now because it's been selectively bred to be just really high and dense in sugar. So that's one of the places I differ from uh, Dr. Pierce Thompson's approach. She, um, she allows fruit on there. Um, however, you know, that's one of the difference between, you know, the dietary structure that she has for her bright line eating uh, versus what I find works really well for my clients for keto. Um, so we are cutting out these fruits. Um, and a lot of people are like, yeah, but isn't fruit really, really healthy? I hope, hopefully my explanation here the last few minutes has helped you see that like, no, fruit isn't very healthy. It's just high in sugar. <laughs> um, and so we're not missing any nutrients in these vitamins and minerals in these uh, fruits uh, that we couldn't get from other things, actually. So um, they're just so palatable. They're really tasty. People love them because they're high in sugar. Like the, the phrase nature's candy, it, there's a reason for that because it's just it truly is really high in sugar. So if we could go back 200 years and eat only the fruits and vegetables that were available then, uh, berries, nuts and seeds and things like that that we had to harvest ourselves, we, we could eat as much as we wanted of those. Because another uh, element of that as well is that those were seasonal things. Like berries are only available. If you go have to go hike and pick them yourself, they're only available a small uh, number of weeks a year. Um, and so if we ate them seasonally and things that we had to collect ourselves, those things would be no problem. However, we live in a world now where we can buy the ones, the, the gerbil sized strawberries and we can buy them all year round. Oh, another one that's really changed in our lifetime is too, is bananas. Um, so bananas look, just do a Google, Google search right now and look up banana, old fashioned bananas or, uh, you know, what ban bananas used to look like. And they're going to look like 
uh, you know, they had really big seeds in there and there wasn't very much fruit at all in there. And so those have also been selectively bred over time to be super high in sugar and very, very sweet as well. And, um, you know, so really good market on bananas. Everybody says, oh, but they're so high in potassium. Well, guess what? That's a marketing uh, gimmick as well, because avocado has way more um, potassium than any banana wishes it ever had. And also fish and seafood, really good source of potassium as well. So we don't need bananas for potassium either. Um, so we've selectively bred these foods. So that's one thing that's happened is agriculture has changed the, the type of food that we have and how rewarding that is. So the higher amount of sugar in a food, and also when we combine sugar and fat together, that triggers the addiction part of our brain. Our brain lights up like a Christmas tree. Uh, it and it will crave that. It will it will want to eat as much as possible. And then it also um, will reinforce that and make you want to eat it more and more and more and more. Um, so my my line of how I help my clients do keto, we do a whole foods based, and we're eliminating those fruits that have been highly um, hybridized and selectively bred to be really high in sugar. So we cut the line there. We're drawing one of our bright lines um, there to eliminate those foods that are going to be high in sugar, low in nutrients. Um, we eat all kinds of, um, you know, animal-based protein. So chicken, fish, and beef, and everything from the sea and land um, that's been around for a really long time. Uh, those are all on the table. Uh, traditional fats that we've eaten for, you know, the 199,900 years of our existence on this planet. We're eating all of those fats. So butter and ghee and lard and uh, chicken schmaltz and uh, naturally occurring fats that are in the cuts of meat and things like that. So again, those are things we've eaten for almost 200,000 years. Um, and uh, you know, and the grains is another category that we're, we're drawing a line in the sand. We're drawing one of our bright lines to eliminate grains because that's another category of food that's also been um, highly refined. So uh, not refined, but um, in the natural state, it's been selectively bred to be really, really high in starch, but not really high in vitamins and minerals. And then we also then add to that processing and refining where they were going to grind it down and turn it into flour. Um, combine that with some kind of a fat. And that's a key to uh, craving and overeating and being addicted to things. So, um, so we're working, um, drawing these lines again in the sand to be able to create a structure, uh, a way of eating that you can follow indefinitely. And part of why this works so well for my clients is because we're getting rid of the foods that make us crave. We're getting rid of the foods that make us overeat. Um, we're, we're left with foods that are tasty and satisfying and enjoyable. And we can eat uh, the way that we have that we're designed to eat for the last 199,000 years. And um, so we're, we're removing the most modern foods that we've got. And so also we want to be really careful as well with this modern all these keto foods that are starting to show up on our shelves and it's highly processed keto foods, they too make us crave and overeat. And so they're not doing us any better just because they're called keto. Um, we really, really want to focus on eating just whole foods that are the most natural form that we can find the closest to the way that we've eaten for the last 199,000 years. Um, so one of the concepts that I work with my clients on defining, and so also know that uh, you're, addiction to food, like processed food, highly palatable food is on a continuum. Okay. So there are some people in the, in the world, uh, they're rare, but they can eat just whatever they eat a, a, a portion of whatever that keeps them at a normal body weight and they don't ever overeat anything. Okay. That's really rare. That's on one end of the, the continuum. Then you've got the other extreme, um, somebody who's very sensitive to sugars and refined processed foods, and they probably have experienced in their life, um, you know, a weight, you know, I've, what I've seen with my clients is as people that have achieved a weight of like 250 pounds or higher tend to be on the far end of the extreme. So, um, and, uh, you know, we're not weight shaming, body shaming or anything like this, this is just the pattern I've seen of your level of addiction to processed food and sugars and things like that will be reflected in what your highest weight was, right? So the people that have gotten to the point where they were five or 600 pounds in the past um, often have, you know, they're at the um, extreme end of food addiction and sensitivity. And so the farther you are on that food addiction um, continuum, 
the more you're going to be have to have very defined structure and rules and lines that you're drawing in the sand or bright lines as Dr. Uh, Pierce Thompson calls them. Uh, as far as like what foods you're going to, you will eat and which ones you're going to stay away from. Um, and so with somebody on this end of the spectrum, the, the can't eat anything, um, you know, they're going to have a lot more flexibility in which foods that do work for them. Um, the farther down you get the continuum on the sensitivity of, uh, I can't stop eating that type of thing. The more structure you're going to have, um, the less flexibility. And so, the concept I like to work with my clients on is called, you know, our the red, red light, yellow light, green light foods, but not only foods, but places, people and things and feelings and so on and so forth and times a day. Um, so um, this can help you determine like where you're at on this continuum, right? So um, first, this person that's down this end that can eat anything they want, like all foods are green light foods to them. They don't, they don't ever have any obsession. They don't have cravings. Uh, they eat something, they enjoy it, and they can have a portion of it and they don't ever think about it again. Um, this is a rare person again. Okay. Um, but on the other end, th this person that's got probably food addiction, lots and lots of cravings, they can never seem to have like portion control. Um, they're going to have a lot more, uh, foods that are red light for them that they can't control their portion, right? So this concept, let me explain it a little bit more then. So red light foods, let's just start with the foods. Red light foods are things that you know that um, you can't control the portion size of what you eat. Um, no, you know, e even one little tiny bite of it turns on the cravings and your appetite and you're just obsessed. Um, and so for my clients, after the first couple of months of working together, we, we start with a basic uh, approach that gets rid of all cravings. Their appetite is nice and low and they have uh, lots of energy and a lot of mental clarity. And so then we'll strategically introduce some other foods after a couple of months of resetting that. And uh, then that's part of everybody gets an individualized approach, right? Because some people are going to have uh, the same food for them might be green light and other people it might be red light where they can never uh, control their portion. So that's one thing you want to watch for is that if you try something and uh, you you can't control the portion, you can't just have a measured amount and then not eat any more of it. Uh, you're obsessed. It turns on appetite. You're just more hungry in general. You just eat more food. Uh, you can't wait to finish the rest of that. Um, you can designate that as a red light food. So this is a line you're going to draw where you're like, I don't eat that food. Um, I don't like the way it makes me feel. I can't control myself and I hate that. Um, and it's just much more enjoyable and pleasurable just to stay away from that in general. So for me, anything with sugar in it, that's in that category for me. Uh, it's a hard no. Um, that's another way, another, um, you know, way of looking at it as well. So red light foods are things that are hard. No, no, thank you. I don't eat that. I do not. Um, yellow light foods are ones that maybe they don't live in your house because you have a little bit of difficulty portion control, um, but maybe at a restaurant or at um, somebody else's house or some kind of event, they may be occasional foods for you. Um, so for me, some examples of yellow light foods are going to be like nuts. Um, if I have them in the house, they're very tasty. I want to eat them until they're gone. I typically will eat more than a portion size. Um, and um, so sometimes I'll have them in the house, measure out a portion put them in the freezer. But also most of the time I don't like to have them in the house because I will end up overeating. Um, uh, green light foods are ones you can have in unlimited portions in your home, out on the counter. Um, you can eat uh, a, a normal size portion of that. You enjoy it, but you don't crave it. It doesn't turn on your appetite and it doesn't make you obsessed with um, food or that item, right? So green light foods a lot, often are things like, uh, you know, steak, chicken, you know, a lot of animal proteins, but even butter by itself, is going to be green light food for most people, right? Because think of how many tablespoons of butter could you just eat in one portion? Hmm? You're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be pretty limited on how much of that you would eat. Um, now, when you add butter and sweetness together, that's typically yellow or green light for most people. I'm, I'm sorry, yellow or red light for most people, right? Because that's where that combination is what's called the highly palatable combination. Sweet and fat together makes us eat as much as possible. So um, you might also then draw a line with, um, I don't eat sweet and fat things together because that turns on appetite and cravings. Um, it might be yellow light. So for example, some keto desserts on special occasions, I will make designations of that. Um, but I don't have them in my house every day because I will I will seek them out and eat them as much as <laughs> until they're gone. So um, 
Susan's sharing that um, if I cannot stop at one serving, uh, I red light it. Okay, she's got this concept down. Yeah, low carb tortillas and cheese uh, equal red light. It's a hard no for me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Great example. Thanks for sharing, Susan. Um, yeah. So this is you know part of drawing you know creating your own structure, figuring out what works for you personally. Um, part of why it's so complicated, right? Like everybody's like. Why is keto so complicated? Why are there so many different versions of it? And well, it's because we're all individuals and we're all someplace different on that uh, food addiction um, continuum. And, you know, working with trial and error and getting the right kind of support to figure those things out too. So, um, yeah. So if you're somebody that's struggling with this, if you're like, oh man, this is, uh, I really, you know, this is a lot to unpack. And uh it takes time to figure these things out. And we often have the fantasy that we'd like, oh, I just want to lose weight really quickly and heal my metabolism. And then I'm just going to go right back to, you know, higher carb intake. How, how, how soon can I go back to eating high carb again or higher carbs? Right. So, um, you know, so the quiz, I, I gave a little quiz early on in the uh, show today about, um, true or false. Um, once you lose the weight on keto and heal your metabolism, you can slowly go back to eating the food you ate before. Um, it was kind of a trick question. It's not actually a true or false. It's more of like, it depends. Um, for some people, they will be able to eat a higher carb amount and, uh, depends on where you're at on that addiction spectrum. Right. And for some people, most people I'm working with, there's going to be, um, you know, eating the way that you ate before got you where you were. So likely there's going to be some of the things you were eating before that, um, should be off limits. So, um, now I know a lot of people struggle with feeling like, oh, but I'm, I'm going to feel deprived if I have to mark foods off limits, right? But think about before um, you attempted keto or you're on keto right now and all foods were on, okay, how did that work for you? Like, Dr. Phil, how's that working for you, right? Uh, it, it didn't work. And so we've got to come to terms with the fact that if you want you want to lose weight, you want to keep it off, you have to make some sacrifices, you have to make some permanent changes. You have to make some bright lines, designations, specific structure about what you do eat and what you don't eat. Um, because I'll tell you, it's so much easier uh, to follow 100% within your lines, like draw your little line in the sand of where you eat and what you don't eat. It is so much easier to do 100% within the lines than it is 90% in the lines and then 10% of whatever, right? Uh, how many of you have done well for a while and then you start incorporating some other things and then just things go haywire. So, uh, so think of, you know, think of what those lines are for you. You, you know, the red, yellow, green light concept may help you decide what those are. Um, you know, combinations of food again. So combining sugar and fat together is going to be something that, uh, you know, for me, that's not real sugar is a red, a hard no. Um, Keto friendly sweeteners with fat to me is a yellow. Like I got to be really careful with that. That doesn't live in my house. Uh, but for some people that might be a, a red light that you just never, you never go there. So um, Susan here is saying uh, after uh, over a year on keto, I can never go back to sad, which is standard American diet. I will always be low carb and avoid sugar. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. For me, for just how I feel the best and also just my family's, um, health history. Again, what we shared the news article at the very beginning about how your parents and grandparents, what they ate um, will affect how you uh, show up in this world. My family has a history of diabetes and um, uh, dementia. And so for me, I have to uh, stay low carb to be able to manage my health as well too. So, um, all right. What questions does everybody have on this topic here? So uh, normally I have my co-host that, that, it's been uh, interjecting some questions, but you all get to be my guest co-hosts today that are watching. So um, aha's questions there about um, putting those lines in the sand for yourself about what, what works and what doesn't. Um, Donna says, thank you for all you do and all your valuable information. God bless you. What are your thoughts on uh, protein sparing modified fasting and keto? You're welcome, Donna, so much. Yeah, so protein sparing modified fasting, um, I'll use that occasionally with my clients. It's a very good um, weight loss, fat loss, specifically accelerator. Um, it typically is not something that, that is long-term sustainable though, but it's like basically extremely high protein, very low fat is protein sparing modified fasting. It's a very effective tool for uh, rapidly shedding some fat, but again, it's not something that's sustainable long-term. And so it has to be balanced by, um, I think of it as like 
a tool you can use periodically to do like a fat loss sprint. Um, put some parameters around that as well. So maybe you're going to do that for four weeks or six weeks and then take a break and go back to like regular baseline uh, keto for you as well too. So um, I think it's a really good compliment. And for some of my clients, um, they've really enjoyed. So I've got some uh, program that I'll run once in a while that is the protein sparing modified fasting. And um, they really like it. But also some, some of my clients don't like that as well, because they feel like it's too much like regular dieting where you had to eat really low fat and do all this other measuring and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's for some, it's a fit and some, uh, some just don't like it and they'd rather just do regular keto. So, um, all right. Well, uh, next, the next episode, next week's episode, I'm going to bring you uh, all my best tips, strategies, and uh, techniques for thriving, not only surviving the holidays, but thriving through the holidays. And so uh, we've got our holiday season coming fourth quarter of this year. And uh, so this is a time where a lot of people really struggle from, you know, traditions and foods they've always made. And how do you show love to your family without giving them sugar? Um, so I'll be giving you all my best uh, tips and tricks and strategies. So come back next week and listen to uh, our episode. Um, that's, that's a wrap for today. So, you know, we uh, shared an article a uh, news article about how what you eat not only affects your kids, but your grandkids as well, but also the cravings that you're going to have too. So maybe for some of you, you've got an insight about, oh my gosh, like my whole family's been addicted. Uh, that's why uh, we all are so crazy about sugar and it's really hard for us to give it up. Um, and so also we talked about how creating some structure in your keto diet is essential for you being able to stick with it for the long term and not fall back into overeating uh, as excessive appetite uh, triggers too. Uh, the red light, yellow light, green light concept we talked about. Um, so if you're struggling at all, um, again, I'll share my text number here. So 602-704-5309. Uh, text me and tell me you heard, uh, you know, on the podcast and that's why I'll, I'll know where you came from when, uh, and we can continue the conversation by text too. So if you're, if you're struggling with this and uh, need some help in figuring out structure in your keto lifestyle, uh, let me, let me see if I can help you out. So, um, thank you all for being here and watching, listening and engaging. Love you guys for being here. Uh, remember sharing is caring. So share this episode with a friend. Uh, if you're watching the replay, um, you know, hashtag replay in the comments. So let me know that you've listened or watched. Um, and uh, remember our tagline for our show is remember, help us grow and we'll help you shrink. So thank you all for being here. We'll see you all next time. Bye Susan. Bye Donna. Bye anybody else who's here too. We'll see you later. <laughs>